Politics, we continue the society's proud tradition of inviting and hosting some of the world's leading figures to address us. We exist as a society to promote debate and the discussion of ideas, and tonight is no exception. I urge all of you here this evening to make full use of the question and answer session that will happen later on tonight. With that said, I now ask you to join with me in welcoming Dr. Zakir Naik to address the society. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ya ayyuhan nasu inna khalaqnaku min zakin wa unsa wa jannakum. Shu'u ma'u wa qaba ila di ta'rafu. I welcome all of you with the Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. May peace, mercy and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of Almighty God, be on all of you. It's an honor and a great pleasure for me to address this historic Oxford Union. And I would like to thank the Oxford Union, especially its president, Mr. James Langman, for making this event possible. The topic of my talk today is Islam and the 21st century. Islam comes from the root word salam, which means peace. It's also derived from the Arabic word film, which means to submit your will to Almighty God. Islam, in short, means peace acquired by submitting our will to Almighty God. And any person who submits the will to Almighty God, he is called as a Muslim. Many people have a misconception that Islam is a new religion, which came into existence 1400 years ago. And Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the founder of this religion. In fact, Islam is there since time immemorial, since man set foot on this earth. And Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is not the founder of this religion, but he is the last and final messenger of Almighty God. The religion of Islam is based on the teachings of the glorious Quran, which came into existence 1400 years back. Is it possible? that today the humanity at large in this 21st century can gain guidance how a life should be led from a book which is 1400 years old. But natural, the answer obviously is no if this book is written by a human being. But the glorious Quran is the last and final revelation of Almighty God which was revealed to the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. The glorious Quran is the proclamation to humanity. It is the fountain of mercy and wisdom. It's a guide to the erring. It's a warning to the heedless. It's an assurance to those in doubt. It's a solace to the suffering. And it is a hope to those in despair. The glorious Quran is the last and final revelation of Almighty God, which was revealed to the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. For any book to claim that it is a word of God. For any book to prove that it is the revelation from Almighty God, it should stand the test of time. Previously in the olden days, it was the age of miracles. The glorious Quran is the miracle of miracles. Later on came the age of literature and poetry. Muslim and non-Muslim Arabic scholars alike, they acclaim the glorious Quran to be the best Arabic literature available on the face of the earth. But today, if a religious book in a very poetic fashion says, the world is flat, will a modern man believe in it? But naturally the answer is no. Because today is not the age of literature and poetry. Today is the age of science and technology. With its glorious Quran, is compatible or incompatible with modern science. According to Albert Einstein, the famous physicist and the Nobel Prize winner, who I'm told, also addressed this historic Oxford Union. He said, science without religion is lame and religion without science is blind. Let me remind you, the glorious Quran is not a book of science, but it's a book of signs, S-I-G-N-S. It's a book of ayats, it's a book of verses. And the glorious Quran has more than 6,000 signs, 6,000 ayats, 6,000 verses, out of which more than a thousand speak about science. As far as my talk today is concerned, 
I will only be speaking about scientific facts. I will not be speaking about scientific hypotheses and theories, which all of us know many a time, these theories and hypotheses take U-turns. In the field of astronomy, a few decades earlier, in the 1970s, there were a group of scientists who described how the universe came into existence, for which they got the Nobel Prize. This they called as the Big Bang. And these scientists said that initially, our universe was one primary nebula. Then there was a secondary separation. There was the Big Bang, which gave rise to galaxies, the stars, the planets, the sun, as well as the earth on which we live. This they called as the Big Bang. This, what the scientists discovered about 40 years back, is mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago, in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 30, where it says, Avalam yaral lazina kafiru. Do not the unbelievers see. Anna samawati wal arda. Kaan tarat faftak nahuma. That the heavens and the earth were joined together and we clove them asunder. This big bang, which the scientists discovered recently, is mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago. Previously, we human beings, we thought that the world was flat. It was in 1577 when Sir Francis Drake sailed around the earth that he first time proved that the earth on which we live, it is spherical in shape. The Quran mentions 1400 years ago in Surah Naziat, chapter number 79, verse number 30. Wal arda ba da zalika dhaha. And thereafter, we have made the earth egg shape. One of the meaning of Daha is an expanse, and the earth is an expanse. The other meaning is derived from the Arabic word Duya, which means an egg. And today we know the earth is not completely round like a ball. It is flattened from the pole. It is geospherical in shape. The Arabic word Dahaha doesn't refer to a normal egg. It specifically refers to the egg of an ostrich. And if we analyze, the egg of an ostrich is too geospherical in shape. The glorious Quran, 1400 years ago, says, that the earth is geospherical in shape. Previously, we thought that the light of the moon was its own light. Recently, we have come to know that the light of the moon is not its own light, but it is a reflected and borrowed light. The Quran says in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 61, Blessed is he who has placed the constellation in the sky and placed the herin, sun, a lamp having its own light and moon having borrowed or reflected light. So the Quran describes the moonlight as borrowed or reflected, which we came to know recently in science. Recently in science means 50 years back, 100 years back, 200 years back. When I was in school, I passed my school in 1982, about 29 years back. There I'd learned in science that the sun, though it revolves, it does not rotate about its own axis. But the Quran mentions in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 33, Huwal lazik layl wa nahara. It is he who has created the night and the day. Washamsa wal kamar, the sun and the moon. Kullun fi falki has bahoon, each one traveling in orbit with its own motion. The Quran says the sun and the moon, besides revolving, it also rotates about its own axis. Recently, a few decades earlier, science has come to know that the sun rotates and takes about 25 days to complete one rotation, which has been incorporated in most of the school textbooks throughout the world. There may be certain skeptics who will say, it's nothing great that the Quran speaks about astronomy since the Arabs were advanced in the field of astronomy. I do agree that the Arabs were advanced in the field of astronomy, but I'd like to remind them that the Arabs became advanced in the field of astronomy a few hundred years after the Quran was revealed. So it is from the Quran that the Arabs learned about astronomy and not the vice versa. In the field of hydrology, we learn in the school about the water cycle. How the water evaporates from the ocean, forms into clouds, moves into interior, falls down as rain, and the water is replenished. This was first described by Sir Bernard Palissy in the year 1580. The Quran too describes the water cycle in great detail 1400 years ago. The Quran speaks about the water cycle in great detail in several places. In Surah Az-Zumur, chapter number 39, verse number 21. In Surah Rum, chapter number 30, verse number 24. In Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse number 18. In Surah Hijar, chapter number 15, verse number 22. In Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 43. In Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse number 57. In Surah Rod, chapter number 13, verse number 17. 
in Surah Furqan chapter number 25, verse number 48 and 49, in Surah Fatir chapter 35, verse number 9, in Surah Yasin chapter number 36, verse number 34, in Surah Jasha chapter number 45, verse number 5, in Surah Qaf chapter number 50, verse number 8 and 9, in Surah Waqiyah chapter number 56, verse number 68 to 70, in Surah Mulk chapter 67, verse number 30, in Surah Tariq chapter number 86, verse number 11, I can go on and on giving references only in the Quran of the several verses which speak about the water cycle in great detail. In the field of oceanography, there's a verse in the Quran, in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 53, which says that he has let two bodies of flowing water, one sweet and palatable and the other salty and bitter. Though they meet, they do not mix. There is a barrier which is forbidden to be trespassed. The commentator of the Quran could not understand what does God Almighty mean by saying that these two waters, when they meet, they do not mix and there is a barrier which is forbidden to be trespassed. Today, after science has advanced, we have come to know that whenever one type of water flows into the other type of water, it loses its constituents and gets homogenized into the water it flows. This today science calls as the transitional homogenizing area, which the Quran refers to as barzak, as a barrier. And this can be seen in Cape Point, the southernmost tip of South Africa. And when we see even the color of the water between these two types of water differs. And Professor Hay, a very famous oceanologist, he said that this information came to the human knowledge recently. This book, the Quran, it's difficult to explain how does it mention 40 years ago. In the field of biology, the Quran says in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 30, that we have created every living thing from water. Will you not then believe? Imagine in the deserts of Arabia, the Quran says every living thing is made from water. Who could have believed in it? Today, after science advanced, we have come to know that every living being, it contains cells. And the basic substance of cell is the cytoplasm, which contains about 80 percent water. Today, science tells us that every living creature contains 50 to 90 percent water. In the field of botany, previously we did not know that even the plants have got sexes male and female. The Quran says in Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse number 53, that it is he who sends on water from the sky and with it brings diverse pairs of plants, each separate from the other. The Arabic word azwaj, meaning pair, saying that the plants have got sexes, male and female. In the field of zoology, the Quran says in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 38, it is he who has made every animal that walks on the earth and every bird that flies in the air to live in communities like the human beings. Today, science agrees that even the animals and the birds live in communities like the human beings, which was not known earlier. The Quran speaks about the lifestyle of the bee in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 68 and 69. The Quran speaks about the lifestyle of the spider in Surah Ankabud, chapter number 29, verse number 41. The Quran speaks about the lifestyle and the communication of ants in Surah Namal, chapter number 27, verse number 17 and 18. In the field of medicine, the Quran says in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse 68 and 69, that from the belly of the bee, we give you a drink of varying colors in which there is healing for mankind. It is recently we have come to know that the honey that we have is obtained from the belly of the bee. And today science agrees that there are mild antiseptic properties in honey and it is even a healing for mankind. In the field of physiology, the Quran describes the blood circulation and the production of milk in a nutshell in Surah Nahal, chapter 16, verse number 66. 600 years after the Quran was revealed, Ibn Nafis, he made it known to the world about the production of milk and blood circulation. 400 years later, that is 1,000 years after the Quran was revealed, William Harvey, he made it famous to the Western world. In the field of embryology, the Quran describes the various embryological stages of the human development in great detail in Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse number 12 to 14. It says that the human we were nutfa, then we made it into an alaka, a mudga, a zama, that human being is created from a minute quantity of fluid. Then it made it into alaka, 
that is a leech-like substance, then made it into a chewed-like lump, then made it into bones, then clothed the bones with flesh. When this verse was showed in the early part of the 1980s to Dr. Keith Moore, who at that time happened to be the highest authority in the field of anatomy and embryology, he was the head of the department in the University of Toronto. He said that the description of the Quran is far superior to what modern embryology describes today instead of stage one, two, three. And he said that it's not possible that any human being can mention these things in the Quran. This Quran has to be the word from Almighty God, and he has no objection in accepting Prophet Muhammad as the messenger of Almighty God. Time does not permit me to speak a lot about science. I'll just give one more example which is mentioned in the Quran. The Quran mentions in Surah Qiyamah, chapter number 75, verse number 3 and 4, that when the unbelievers say that how will Almighty God be able to reconstruct our bones after we are dead, we are buried, our bones have got disintegrated, on the day of judgment, how will Almighty God be able to reconstruct our bones? Almighty God replies in the Quran and says, tell them, Almighty God can not only reconstruct the bones, he can even reconstruct in perfect order the very tips of the fingers. What does Quran mean by saying, God can not only reconstruct the bones, he can even reconstruct in perfect order the very tips of the fingers. It was in 1880 that Sir Francis Gold, he discovered the fingerprinting method and he said, that no two fingerprints, even in millions of people, are identical. And today, this fingerprinting method is used by the police to identify the criminal. It's used by CIA, by FBI, by the police worldwide. This Quran mentions 1400 years ago. Francis Bacon, a very famous philosopher, he said, little knowledge of science makes a person an atheist, but in-depth knowledge of science makes a person a believer in God. That is the reason today, scientists are not eliminating God, they're eliminating models of God. La ilaha illallah. There's no God, but Allah. And Almighty God says in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 70, And we have honored the children of Adam. Almighty God says in the Quran, that all the children of Adam, irrespective whether they're black or white, male or female, whether they're born in UK or India or USA, whichever part of the world they belong to. Almighty God has honored all the children of Adam, all the human beings. And Islam does not only speak about universal brotherhood, it practically demonstrates that every Muslim who follows the religion of Islam should practically practice it minimum five times in the day. I'm talking about one of the pillars of Islam, that is Salah, which is the prayer. And a beloved prophet, Muhammad peace be upon him said, that when you stand for prayer, you should stand shoulder to shoulder. Irrespective of whether the person standing next to you is black or white, rich or poor, king or pauper. When you stand for prayer, you have to stand shoulder to shoulder. This demonstrates the universal brotherhood every day, minimum five times a day. And another example is Hajj, which is one of the pillars of Islam that every rich person who has the means and who has the health to travel to Makkah for the pilgrimage should at least do it once in his lifetime. And Hajj is the biggest annual gathering in the world where about three to four million people from different parts of the world, from USA, from Canada, from UK, from India, from Malaysia, from different parts of the world, they gather together in one place in Makkah and Arafat and they are dressed in two pieces of unsold cloth which is white in color. You cannot identify the person standing next to you as king or a pauper. And all of them come on a common statement. Labbaik, Allahumma labbaik. Here we are, oh my Lord, here we are at your service. Islam practically demonstrates universal brotherhood. Many religions believe that humankind has been created from a single pair of Adam and Eve. May peace be upon them both. But there are some religions who put the blame only on Eve for the downfall of humanity, for the origin sin. But if you read the Quran, the blame for disobeying Almighty God is equally put on both Adam and Eve. May peace be upon them. The Quran says in Surah Araf chapter 7, verse number 19 to 27, Adam and Eve, peace be upon them, 
they are both addressed more than a dozen times. Both of them, they disobeyed God. Both of them repented and both were forgiven. The Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse number 1, respect the womb that bore you. The Quran says in Surah Luqman, chapter number 31, verse number 14, we have enjoined on the human beings to be kind to the parents. In travail upon travail did the mother bore them, and in years twain was the weaning. The Quran repeats the message in Surah Akaf, chapter number 46, verse number 15. We have enjoined on the human beings to be good to the parents. In pain did the mother bear them, and in pain did she give them birth. So pregnancy uplifts a woman, does not degrade her. And our beloved Prophet said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari. Sahih Bukhari is one of the collections of the authentic sayings of the last and final messenger Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. It's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 8, in the Book of Manners, chapter number 2, hadith number 2. A man approaches the Prophet and asks him that who deserves the maximum companionship and love in this world? Prophet said, your mother. The man asked after that who? The Prophet repeated, your mother. The man asked after that who? Again the Prophet said, your mother. The man asked for the fourth time after that who? Then the Prophet said, your father. That means 75%, three-fourths of the companionship goes to the mother, 25%, one-fourth goes to the father. In short, the mother gets the gold medal, she gets the silver medal, as well as the bronze medal. The father has to be satisfied with a mere consolation prize. These are the teachings of Islam which we have to agree. And if we analyze, Islam gave economic rights to women 1300 years before the Western world. 1400 years ago, Islam gave right to any adult Muslim woman to own or disown the property without the permission of anyone else. The first time the Western world gave right for a woman to own or disown property was in 1870s under the Married Woman Property Act, which said that a married woman, adult, can own or disown the property without the permission of the husband. And this act was later revised. Islam gave economic rights to women 1300 years before the Western world. And in Islam, we do not agree with the word housewife, which is used in English language, because we don't consider the woman to be married to the house, to be called a housewife. We prefer calling her as homemaker, the person who makes the home, the person who builds the home. Though we see that there are many misconceptions and many people think that men and women in Islam are not equal. In fact, in Islam, men and women are equal. But equality does not mean identicality. They're equal, but they are not identical. Depending upon the physiological makeup, their psychological makeup, their biological makeup, they have different roles. Overall, men and women are equal in some aspects. The woman, she may have a degree of advantage. In some aspects, the men may have a degree of advantage. Let me give you an example. If there are two students in a class, student A and B, both of them, they come out first in examination. Both get 80 out of 100. When we analyze the answer sheet, the 10 questions, which have 10 answers, each carrying 10 marks. In answer to question number one, student A, gets 9 out of 10. Student B gets 9 out of 10. In answer to question number 2, student B gets 9 out of 10, and student A, he gets 7 out of 10. In all the remaining 8 answers, both get 8 out of 10. If we add up, both get 80 out of 100, they're equal. But in answer number 1, the student A has the degree of advantage. In answer number 2, student B has the degree of advantage. In the other aspects, both are equal. And overall also they're equal. In the same way, men and women in Islam are equal. In some aspects, the men have a degree of advantage. In some aspects, the women have a degree of advantage. For example, if a robber, if a thief enters my house, I will not say I believe in women liberalization. I will not ask my wife or my daughter to go and fight. Since God has given me more strength, it is my duty to fight. As the Quran says in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 34, that God has given more strength to men. It is his duty to protect the woman. So in strength, the men have a degree of advantage. And the other example I gave earlier, that where companionship of the children is concerned for the parents, the women have three times more companionship as compared to men. 
the mother has three times more companionship as compared to father. So here, the women have a degree of advantage. So as I said earlier, men and women in Islam are equal. In some aspects, the women have a degree of advantage. In some aspects, the men have a degree of advantage. The foundation of the religion of Islam is the belief in one and only sole creator and sustainer. And this creator and sustainer, almighty God, is the same for all the human beings. Only if you agree that our creator, sustainer and cherisher, one God, is the same, then only can brotherhood be maintained in all religions. And this is the basis of all the religions. Religion, according to Oxford Dictionary, means a belief in a superhuman controlling power, a personal God or gods that deserve worship and obedience. So according to Oxford Dictionary, religion means belief in God. If you understand God, you understand that religion in the right perspective. Quran says in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse number 64, Ta'ala wila kalimatin sawa im baina bainakum. Come to common terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na'buda illallah. That you worship none but one almighty God. So the Quran says, let the people of different religions come to common terms. What is different, we can discuss tomorrow. Let us agree to follow what is common. And one thing common in all the religion is to believe and worship only one God. To understand any religion or to understand the concept of God in a religion, it is not appropriate to try and observe the followers of that religion. Because many a time the followers themselves may not be aware about the religion or the concept of the God in religion. The best and the most authentic way of understanding a religion or understanding the concept of God in a religion is to try and understand what the authentic scriptures of that religion have to speak about God. Let's try and understand the concept of God in the major religions in the nutshell. First, we'll try to understand the concept of God in Hinduism. The two major and most authentic scriptures in the religion of Hinduism are the Vedas and the Upanishad. It's mentioned in the Chandogya Upanishad, chapter number six, section number two, verse number one. Ikkam evidityam. God is only one without a second. This is a Sanskrit quotation. It's mentioned in the Sveta Svetar Upanishad, chapter number six, verse number nine. Nacha se kasaj, janitana chadipa, of that God, he has got no parents, he has got no lord, he has got no father, he has got no mother, he has got no superior. It's mentioned in the Sveta Svetar Upanishad, chapter number 4, verse number 19, as well as Yajur Ved, chapter number 32, verse number 3, Na tasya pratima asti. Of that God, there is no pratima. Pratima is a Sanskrit word which means an image, a photograph, a painting, a picture, a sculpture, a statue, an idol. It says, of that God, there is no image, there is no picture, there is no painting, there is no portrait, there is no statue, there is no idol, there is no sculpture. And the Brahma Sutra of Hinduism, the fundamental creed of Hinduism is Ekam Brahm Devutya Naste, Nena Naste Kinchan, Bhagwan Eki Hai, Dusra Nahi Hai, Nahi Hai, Nahi Hai, Zara Bhi Nahi Hai. There is only one God, not a second one, not at all, not at all, not in the least bit. So if you read the Hindu scriptures, you shall understand the concept of God in Hinduism and understand Hinduism in the right perspective. Let's discuss the concept of God in Judaism. It's mentioned in the Old Testament in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 6, verse number 4. Moses, peace be upon him, says, Shama Israelo, Adnahin Adnaikat, Yoro Israel, the Lord, our God, is one Lord. It's mentioned in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 43, verse number 11. I am Lord and there's no savior besides me. So if you read the Old Testament, you should understand the concept of God in Judaism and understand Judaism in the right perspective. Before we discuss the concept of God in Christianity, I would like to clarify a few points. Islam is the only non-Christian faith which makes it an article of faith to believe in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. No Muslim is a Muslim if he does not believe in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. We believe that he was one of the mightiest messengers of Almighty God. We believe he was the Messiah, translated Christ. We believe that he was born miraculously without any male intervention, which many modern day Christians today do not believe. We believe 
that he gave life to the dead with God's permission. We believe he healed those born blind and lepers with God's permission. The Christians and the Muslims, we are going together. One may ask, then where is the parting of ways? The parting of ways is that many Christians believe, or most of the Christians believe, that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he claimed divinity. They believe that he was Almighty God. If you read the Bible, there is not a single unequivocal statement. In the complete Bible, where Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, himself says that I am God, or where he says worship me. In fact, if you read the Bible, it's mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 28. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, my father is greater than I. Gospel of John, chapter number 10, verse number 29, my father is greater than all. Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 12, verse number 28. I cast out devils with the Spirit of God. Gospel of Luke, chapter number 11, verse number 20. I with the finger of God cast out devils. Gospel of John, chapter number 5, verse number 30. I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just. For I seek not my will, but the will of my Father. Anyone who says I seek not my will, but the will of Almighty God, he's a Muslim. As I mentioned, Muslim means a person who submits his will to God. And Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, not my will, but the will of Almighty God. So in Arabic, we say he's Muslim. Therefore, we say Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was one of the mightiest messengers of Almighty God. And he further clarified in the Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 24, he said, that the words that you hear are not mine, but my father's who has sent me. It's clearly mentioned in the book of Acts. Chapter number 2, verse number 22, it says, Amen of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God amongst you by wonders and miracles and signs, which God did by him and you are witness to it. A man approved of God amongst you by wonders and miracles and signs, which God did by him and you are witness to it. And when Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was asked, that which is the first of the commandments, he repeated verbatim what was said by Moses, peace be upon him, earlier. It's mentioned in the Gospel of Mark. Chapter number 12, verse number 29. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, Shama Israelo Adna Hainu Abnai Khad, which means, Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, is one Lord. So if you read the Bible, you should understand the concept of God in Christianity and understand Christianity in the right perspective. Let's discuss the concept of God in Islam. The best reply that any Muslim can give you regarding the concept of God in Islam is quote to you Surah Ikhlas. That is chapter number 112. Verse number one to four, which says, Kul hu Allah ahad. Say he's Allah one and only. Allah samad. Allah, the absolute and eternal. Lam yulid wa lam yulad. He begets not, nor is begotten. Walam yakul lau kufana. There's nothing like him. This is a four line definition of Almighty God. Any person says so and so candidate is God. If he passes these four tests, we Muslims have got no objection in accepting as God. The first is, say he's one and only. The second is, he should be absolute and eternal. The third, he begets not nor is he begotten. And fourth, there's nothing like unto him anything in this world. This is a four-line definition of Almighty God, which we call as the litmus test for theology. It is the touchstone of theology. And further, the Quran says in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 108, that revile not, abuse not those gods who they worship besides Allah, lest in their ignorance, they will revile, they will abuse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Quran prohibits any Muslim from speaking bad, from reviling, from abusing those who other people worship as God besides Allah. Lest in their ignorance, they will abuse Allah. So to understand the concept of God in Islam, you have to read the Quran. Today, unfortunately, Islam is the most misunderstood religion in the world. The religion which has the maximum misconception in the world today, it is Islam. And one of the reasons for these misconceptions about this religion, I would say it is the media. Today we find in the international media, there is virulent propaganda regarding Islam. We find in the international newspapers, in the international magazine, on the regular broadcast stations, on the internet satellite channels, there is virulent propaganda regarding Islam. Islam condemns all forms of terrorism. Islam condemns the killing of any innocent human being, unfortunately. So Islam is a religion which condemns all sorts of terrorism. Today, the media portrays Islam as a religion which promotes terrorism. Every community has its black sheep. And I'm also aware 
that there are black sheep in the Muslim community. What does the media do? The media picks up the black sheep of the Muslim community and they portray as though they're exemplary Muslims. Because of this today, we find that most of the people think that Islam promotes terrorism. If you read the Quran, if you read the sayings of the Prophet, Islam amongst all the religions is at the foremost in condemning the killing of innocent human beings. I would like to conclude my speech by giving a message. Peace is the only solution for the problems of humanity. Many nations, many countries have armies. They have got military, they have got navy, they have got air force. Some countries have weapons of mass destruction. Some have nuclear weapons. Believe me, all these are not the solution for the problems of humanity. The only solution according to me for the problems of humanity is peace. There may be differences. There are differences in culture. There are differences in languages. There are differences in color. There's difference of society. Irrespective of the differences, one common factor amongst all human beings of the world is that all want peace. I said at the starting of my talk, Islam is derived from the Arabic word salam, which means peace. And this word salam is mentioned in the Quran no less than 43 times. And along with its derivatives, it's mentioned no less than 143 times. Salam, peace, is mentioned in the Quran no less than 143 times. And I started my talk by greeting all of you, Assalamu Alaikum, which means peace be on all of you. One of the attributes of Almighty God is Assalam, the source of peace. Quran says in Surah Maida, chapter 5, verse number 16, that Almighty God guides those people who come towards Him, towards peace and safety, and takes them out of darkness into light. According to me, peace is the only solution. My message is only of peace. And I am a person who spreads peace. My mission is to spread peace. I would like to end my talk with the quotation of Dr. Adam Pearson. Dr. Adam Pearson said, people worry that one day nuclear weaponry will fall in the hands of the Arabs. They fail to realize that the Islamic bomb, the bomb of peace, has already been dropped. It fell the day Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was born. Wa akhru dawan, alhamdulillah, Good afternoon, Dr. Naik. Um, my name is Izzy Westbury. I'm the secretary here at the Oxford Union. What's the question, sister? In your speech, you talk about the hijab being something that serves to protect a woman. But how is it not extremely patronizing and degrading in not allowing the woman to make that decision herself? If you read the Quran, the Quran and Islam has prescribed hijab. That means the woman should be covered. This is for the modesty. And it is not only mentioned in the Quran, it is also mentioned in the Bible. If you read the Bible in the first Timothy, chapter number two, verse number nine, it says that women should be dressed up with shamefacedness. They should be dressed up with sobriety and should not wear braided hair or gold or pearls. It's further mentioned in the first Corinthians, chapter number 11, verse number five, six. The woman that does not cover her head, then she dishonors her head. A head should be shaved off. Anyway, I don't agree with this. I'm just quoting you from the Bible. Same way if you go to the Vedas, it says that the woman should cover the head. So all the religious scriptures, they talk about the woman covering their head. It is for modesty. On the March of 9th, 2009, Sunday Times carried an article. In Britain, one out of seven feel that the woman who wear sexy revealing clothes, she should be hit. I'm sorry, I don't agree with it. This is the statistics that was given in the Sunday Times on the 9th of March, 2009 that in Britain, one out of seven Britishers believe that the women who were revealing and sexy clothes should be hit. I disagree with this. Furthermore, one more article came in 2005. In the same newspaper, Sunday Times, it said that 26% of the Britishers, they feel that wearing revealing clothes is partially or totally responsible for the rape. So what I say, that the more modestly you are dressed up, you are respected more. So Islam has prescribed the modest hijab 
for the woman not to degrade her but to uplift her. I do agree there may be cultural differences. Islam cannot force anyone to adopt it. There are cultural differences. For example, I'll give you an example. That some societies, what they feel, that even looking at a woman is immodest. Some societies feel looking is no problem, but touching a woman is immodest. Some of the societies feel shaking hand is no problem. Some societies feel kissing no problem. Some societies feel doing anything as long as both agree is no problem. Different societies and different cultures have got different rules and regulations. When I went to America, while I was giving a talk, one of the American told me, you Eastern woman, you are immodest. I was shocked. So I said, why do you call the Eastern woman immodest? He told me, you Eastern woman, you expose your belly. So in America and Western country, exposing belly is immodesty. In India, exposing belly is not immodesty, wearing shorts is immodesty. So what I've realized, sister, there's different culture, there's different system. Islam cannot force anyone to adopt. It's clearly mentioned in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 256, like Rafiddin, there is no compulsion religion. But if some women want to adopt the hijab because they feel modest and they feel respected, I feel no other woman should disagree. And when I've been to UK, I've seen hundreds and thousands of women who do cover their hair and who feel that they are uplifted because of this modesty. Hope that answers the question. Good evening, Dr. Zakir Naik. My name is Dr. Ramzi from Oxford, uh, Ambassador of the Universal Peace Federation, and one of the members of the Muslim Council of Britain. I would like to say you are doing an excellent job. God bless you. <laughs> now my question, Dr. Zakir Naik, in your opinion, is Islamophobia a real phenomenon? And if so, how do you suggest it can be tackled? Does the responsibility lie with the Muslim community? Or should Western society be doing more to breach this barrier of fear? I'm talking about the fear, all phobias are fear, fear of unknown. Thank you. The brother asked a very good question that is Islamophobia a real phenomena? How should it be tackled? Is it the responsibility of the Muslim community to do it? Yes, there is Islamophobia, especially in this 21st century. And as I mentioned in my speech, I believe one of the major reasons for this Islamophobia is the media. And I said in my speech, that the media spreads several misconceptions about this religion of Islam. I do agree it is the duty of us Muslims that we should spread the true teachings of Islam. I'm aware that there are black sheep in the Muslim community. I'm not saying all Muslims are 100% pious, all are good. There are black sheep in every community, including Muslims. What does the media do? They pick up the black sheep of the Muslim community and they portray on the media as though they're exemplary Muslims. What we have to do is we have to portray the right teachings of Quran and the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And if any Muslim is involved in doing acts which are against the religion of Islam, which are acts of terrorism, killing of innocent human beings, it is the duty of us Muslims that we should tell such people it is haram. There are some people who are being misguided and they have been brainwashed into saying that killing innocent human beings is part of Islam. It's our duty as the mainstream Muslims to try and convey the right message of Islam and the government should not think that Muslims are part of the problem. They should think Muslims are part of the solution. And that's the advice I even give to the police of India and the police of Bombay. And I interact with the police force very often. And I tell them that you should take the Muslims in confidence. And the best is to have an interaction. I have addressed many police officers from very different countries and we should try and have a question answer session and remove the misconceptions in their minds and prove to them that Islam is one of the most tolerant religions. It's a peaceful religion. And if you know the teaching of Islam, surely the least 
person that you have to fear is a true Muslim. I'm not talking about the black sheep of the Muslim community. Hope that answers the question. I would like to thank the Oxford Union, especially the president of the Oxford Union, Mr. James Langman, for making this event possible. And I really appreciate with the way they invited me for this talk. And at least now, the people of UK can really see a live telecast that I'm a person who gives the message of peace. In a live telecast, there is no editing. There is no manipulation. You can have more faith in these live telecasts rather than clipping from YouTube, which can be manipulated. I would like to thank the members of the Oxford Union once again, and I hope very shortly, once the exclusion order is reversed, I would like to personally come to the Oxford Union and meet the members of the Oxford Union. Thank you very much.